We're glad that you're here. We have visitors that are with us and we're grateful for your presence. A few announcements we'd like to make. If, if you uh, would, please fill out a card and that's, uh, we'd like record of both our visitors and our members, and you can put it in the collection plate when we pass that. We would appreciate that. A few announcements. Jessica King, the daughter of Chuck and Sheila Tracy, was in a head-on car collision last week. Gratefully, it was not as bad as it could have been. She's home, bruised, sore, and several broken bones, but uh, we want to keep her in our prayers and pray for a quick recovery. Walter Bruce had a nuclear stress test on Wednesday and waiting on the results from that. Angie Goff is here. I know she's still struggling with the lung infection and we want to keep her in our prayers. Marie Wallace, Scott's mother, is now back at the uh, Marietta Nursing Home. She's doing better, we're grateful. Uh, Jake Taylor, they ordered another MRI. This is the grandson of Richard and Molly Bonnet, so no set time on his spinal surgery. Uh, Kim Savage's daughter, Kaylin, and she's here with us this morning. She's uh, undergoing, uh, she had hip surgery. She's doing therapy now. Uh, we want to keep her in our prayers. Kaylin, if you haven't met Kaylin, you have the opportunity. Also, um, Kim's father, John Anthony. Some of you might know John. He's an elder in the church at the West Side Congregation in Tishomingo. He has sepsis. This is the second time in a few months that he's battled with this. He is in the uh, Tishomingo Hospital. We want to keep John Anthony in our prayers. Addie, Addie Polster, um, Carly has taken Addie to the urgent care this morning as we speak. She's been congested and has some things, and so let's keep her in our prayers. Elsie Purnell, Casey Jacobs, Jill Meggie, Robert Polster, Alan Rathman um, is, uh, they're all, we remember them in our prayers. Uh, baby shower for Marissa Sheffield will be October the 16th at uh, 2 p.m. here in the Fellowship Hall. She's registered at babylist.com. And if you'd like to be a hostess for this, please see uh, Cherish or Kelsey by October 1st. Jeanette Fuller is going to have uh, cataract surgery this Wednesday and then the next Wednesday, let's remember her. Tonight, uh, we will be having our power meeting following our evening services. So I hope uh, everyone that's a part of that will stay. If you're not, you don't know what that is, uh, we'll explain it tonight. It's a wonderful ministry that anyone and all can be a part of. Last the leaders will be kicking off on Sunday, September 19th. Uh, and we're looking at probably combining that kickoff with uh, our VBS, we need to give the t-shirts that we had made and the crafts that were made. And we're going to have an ice cream social gathering. We're going to talk about it tonight. So if you're with the last leaders or if you're with the VBS, and if you think you could help out with this, we're talking about getting a tent, some other things. We need to talk about it tonight. We're going to meet at 530 and go over some of these things and discuss and see what the best, we want to know what the best thing is uh, to uh, uh, for, for both uh, events and activities. Friends Day is coming up on Sunday, October the 10th. Willie Franklin will be our guest speaker and we'll have a fellowship meal following that. We'll provide the meat and we're asking everyone to bring salads, vegetables, breads, and desserts. And be praying about and be inviting your friends to come here, Willie Franklin. We're getting the word out to area congregations as well. On the 23rd, His Shoes, Her Shoes Marriage Seminar will be uh, here with Wayne and Tammy Roberts. They do a wonderful job. We're excited about this, and uh, we hope to have a good crowd for that as well. The Minister's Retreat is at Petty John, September 20th and 21st. On, the, on uh, the 25th, they're having the 50th anniversary of Petty John Springs Christian Camp. They're going to have a lot of special activities and a lot of special speakers coming in. There's a lot of pictures. There's a lot of great things that are going to be going on that day, and we hope everybody will participate in that. On the 19th, there is a drive 
a, a fundraising drive that is in place in all the congregations that have a part in Pettijohn, trying to raise funds to build a multi-purpose shelter, tornado shelter, but can be used for other things as well. And so on the 19th, we'll be having a special contribution uh, to, uh, uh, along with our regular contribution. You'll be hearing more about that, but be planning for that. Any other announcements that I may have overlooked? Once again, we're glad that you're here. We're grateful for our visitors, and uh, we look forward to our worshiping God together. Uh, just want to let the congregation know that uh, the elders have visited with John Thomas and that he has agreed to uh, be the deacon in charge over education. Uh, we want to thank all of our teachers and all of our help, that, and uh, he's, he's got a good group to work with. But if you are interested in helping in the education uh, department, uh, John's a man you need to see. We're very, we're very grateful here for his willingness to uh, serve in this capacity. So thank you. Good to see everybody this morning. Sing with me this morning, if you would. <clears throat> we praise thee.
Great to see everybody this morning. There's a lot of faces here that have been sick and gone, and we're so glad to have all y'all back. And we've got a lot of visitors this morning. We're glad to see new faces this morning. Um, you know, Satan would love to, nothing more than to use this COVID to decimate the church and um, we haven't let that happen and I want to say on behalf of the elders how thankful we are of each and every one of you and how um, how we've all stayed strong through this there's been times when you know we've been gone but you know for fear or sickness or whatever but this morning we've got um, the best uh, number we've had in a long long time and um, so it just shows you know the the strength of the church and the health of the church and we're um, we're so happy and thankful that that everyone's hanging in there and uh, using their best judgment on this COVID and we hope that everyone will continue to use that best judgment for what uh, is right for you and your family but uh, it's just encouraging to see the, you know, our chairs and pews this morning uh, pretty full. So we, uh, we really thank you and, and we'll continue to pray on this. Uh, join me in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, how great and how loving of a Father you are. Father, we thank you for your love and your patience that you have for us. We thank you that at this time you allow us to bow our heads as, as your church, Father, to, to talk to you through prayer, to praise you, to ask things of you, to thank you for things, Father. Thank you that you give us this privilege. We know that it is truly a privilege that you've given us. This morning, we're so thankful for those who have struggled with COVID and uh, who have overcome it and who have joined back with us this morning. It's so encouraging and uplifting to all of us to see, uh, see their shining faces back once again, Father. For those of us who still are struggling with COVID, we ask that you just wrap your healing arms around them, Father, and that if it be your will, that uh, they will recover soon and again be able to be with us as a body of Christ. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for each and every brother and sister uh, who is a part of this church. Thank you for uh, the part that each person plays in this church, that as a body, um, all parts of the body are needed to function properly, Father, and we just thank you for each one and for the things that each person in this church does, the, the things that, that we all can see being done and the things that we know uh, many do behind the scenes, Father, that don't get the recognition, but we know what, who they are and what they do, and we are so thankful for that. And Father, we pray that... Uh, You'll just be with the, the, the world over, the church worldwide over, Father. And uh, we pray that if it be your will, Father, that this COVID virus will soon be um, eradicated on this earth, Father, and that we can all go back to our normal ways of life. But we thank you for the tools that you have given us to, to fight against this this. Uh, virus father and just pray that you'll continue to watch over us and keep us safe from that father we thank you for uh, the the many works of this church that we're able to do because of you and because of the uh, the blessings of the money that are given here father and we thank you that we're able to participate in the honduras uh, mission work and we're thankful for the uh, Spanish-speaking work next door, and we thank you for um, our connection with Petty John Springs Christian Camp, and we 
pray that you'll bless that effort on that special contribution Sunday, that it will be a huge success and that much money will be raised for that camp for a good cause. Father, I thank you for um, our brother Todd, and I thank you that he has the ability to uh, deliver your word to us, to teach us, to uh, give us more insight into your holy word, Father. Pray that you'll just continue to bless him with good health and that he'll have a long, uh, uh, long continued uh, ministry here at, at the Medill Church of Christ. Father, I thank you just for everything that you do for us, and I especially thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and who uh, gave his very life for our sins, Father, and let us always remember that and always um, thank you for the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy that we uh, as Christians enjoy because of that sacrifice. We pray that you'll be with us as we worship you this morning, that all we do will be according to your word, and that it will praise and give you all glory, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We'll sing this next song this morning as we begin to prepare our thoughts and our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper. a bit with what uh, what Randy said about how pleased we are to have this many here this morning and we're gradually getting back to normal and uh, we're certainly pleased with that uh, this morning was the very first class over in the fellowship hall for the young adult class and we've been talking about this for a while. And this was the very first meeting of that. And we had 23. 
young adult. Uh, the definition of a young adult, if your children are still in school, you're in that age group. And as I challenge them over there this morning, and I'm going to issue the same challenge to everybody here, if you know of someone that needs to be in that class, let them know and encourage them. We have four teachers, Justin, Lonnie, uh, John, and Dylan. Dylan. And they're going to alternate teaching. And the lesson plan is uh, continuous and similar, uh, but they're, they're going to really, it's going to be a great class. And I'm going to, once again, I'm going to challenge you to encourage anyone uh, who's in that age group to come. Uh, as I told them this morning, the goal is to go to heaven, and we're going to try to make the journey there pleasant. Would you join me in prayer? Father, this morning as we gather around this table, and as we partake of this bread to symbolize your body, and as we think of the sacrifice that you made in our behalf. Father, the love that you showed to us by allowing your son to be crucified is almost beyond our capability to understand and help us all to be sincere about this and be pleased to be part of this love that has been given to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And as we continue this memorial service and, and as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood, once again, we're reminded of the love that Christ showed for us to go to the cross in our behalf. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
I want to reiterate a bit about what Randy said about uh, two weeks from today, uh, we're going to take up a special contribution for a shelter at Pettichon. And I don't know how I can tell you how blessed we are to have Petty John here. Uh, this, the uh, 25th of this month will be the 50th birthday of Petty John Springs Christian Camp. And uh, our goal for the, that is to raise money to build a storm shelter. Uh, we have needed one. We've been pretty fortunate over the years to not need it, but one of these days we're going to need one. And we're going to build one big enough for about 200 people, which is a be a camp and, and uh, staff and everything. So the 19th, there are more than 100 churches that have been affiliated with the camp one way or another over the years. And all of these churches are taking up a special contribution on the 19th toward a storm shelter. And we're going to. So I'm going to ask you to, to uh, kind of put a little money aside for that because it's, it's definitely needed. It's going to be, uh, it'll be used for things in addition to a storm shelter, but it will be available for that. So uh, kind of keep that in mind. And once again, uh, this church has been more or less the driving factor for Petty John. We, uh, the land was done from this congregation. Uh, the money was raised for many of the buildings from this congregation. And uh, it's been a great thing. Uh, we estimate there's been about a thousand baptisms for young people at the camp and no telling how many more as a, a result of what they've learned there and the impact we've had on the young people in our community in our area would you join me in prayer father this morning as we give of our means to help further the word not only in this area, but in many places around the world. And I ask that you be with each of us as we give, that we give with a cheerful heart. And I ask that you be with each of us as we make sure this money is spent wisely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The scripture reading and the lesson this morning. Let's sing number 452. And if it's convenient for you, would you stand with me as we sing together? 452. Standing on the promise.
Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is Genesis 6, beginning in uh, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only on evil continually. So the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe, wipe out mankind who I, whom I have created from the face of the land, mankind and animals as well, and crawling things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're glad that you're here. You know what that is. Some of y'all have been there. I've seen pictures of some of y'all that have been there. I have to tell you what it is. I believe this is in Kentucky, though. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'd be amazed. I want to go see how big it is. Everyone that's been there tells me they, until they saw this, they couldn't believe how Noah got everything in the ark. But once you see this, then uh, they understand, yeah, I can see just how massive it is. Built according to the plans that we read about in God's Word, the very plans that, that uh, told Noah what to do and how to do it and with what material. So we're familiar with that story. I want to look at some lessons from that story. Everyone knows about Noah's Ark. There are people that don't know about the Bible, but they know about Noah's Ark. It's amazing how many people... Uh, you just talk about the ark, and they know about Noah's ark. We've seen documentaries from people trying to find the ark, where it's at. We know about where, but it's never been found, never been uh, verified that, that it has been found. But we believe that, uh, you know, in, in the Bible account, not only that, but the knowledge of the flood. Anthropologists are those that study the history of mankind, and they study different uh, cultures and different time periods. And anthropologists throughout the ages have found almost 300 different stories about the one flood. In every continent in the, in the world, there is evidence of a flood. And so it's something that is without doubt, it, it happened, the flood. And we know about the story. You can uh, see movies and documentaries. There are stories. There, there. Uh, you can get uh, uh, you can get nursery wallpaper about Noah and the ark. You can get a lot of different things about uh, the ark and about the flood. We hear jokes and stories when there's a lot of rain. People say, "Yeah, I saw animals starting to pair up," or someone's building a, a boat. And we know about that rainbow as well that really we call it a rainbow, in all actuality it is really more accurately called the war bow, that God says to Noah and makes a covenant at the end that I will never make war again on the earth with water, with the flood, as far as worldwide flood. We saw this past week and a week and a half the destruction of a flood, although small compared to what this is, but we see the destruction of a flood. I can't imagine. Maybe you've experienced a flood. I, I don't know. But nothing like uh, they're experiencing probably in, in, the, in the east of the United States because of Hurricane Ida. It just brings to mind just how devastating, destructive, and overwhelming this flood is that we read about in Genesis chapter 7. And it's this story is really about how God saved mankind, how God saved Noah and his family. And in some way, the principles that we see in this story are principles that are found in the gospel in the New Testament. Now, we understand the Old Testament, uh, the covenant of, of the patriarchs and the covenant of, of Moses and how it changes. And we'll talk about a minute about the covenant of Christ. But the principles in this story about how God saved Noah are still applicable today, and I think we can learn some things from it. They still apply. 
what saved Noah and how Noah was saved. And I want us to look at those this morning about Noah and really the gospel and the Old Testament. We're going to look at four points. And the first one is that Noah was saved by grace. We think about it, we see what's going on in Genesis chapter 6 and how God looked down upon the world and he was grieved that he even made mankind. Every thought and intent of man was to do evil and it broke God's heart. And they were living in sin, they were in a lost condition, it was an evil time. I'd hate to live in a time as evil as that. We think now it's evil, but I don't think it compares to what was going on in Genesis chapter 6 when God decides that he's going to destroy what he had created. It says that when they became to multiply, began to multiply on the face of of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Now Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, these were mighty men who were of old men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great. And every intent was for them to do evil. But then look at verse 8. God's going to wipe out. He's going to annihilate the earth and everything that's on the earth. Uh, Kevin read where all the birds, all the creatures, every living thing, he's going to wipe out. But verse 8, it says that Noah found favor. Some translations found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, God decided Noah, who is upright and righteous and walks blameless before man, I'm going to save him. And it was by God's grace that Noah was saved. Now, grace or favor, grace means unmerited favor, so either translation is correct. God did not owe Noah anything. Uh, Even though Noah was blameless and righteous, God didn't owe him salvation. But God chose to save him. And he chose to save him because of his grace. And he makes a covenant with him. He says, I am, in verse 17, Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that's on the earth shall perish. But, he says, I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your son's wives with you, and you're going to be saved. I'm going to establish my covenant with you. It wasn't Noah's covenant with God. Noah had no part in this whatsoever. Noah found grace or favor, unmerited favor in the eyes of the Lord, and God said, I am going to save you. Now, the principle is the same today. God looks down upon us, and we are living in sin. Sin is all around us. In Romans chapter 6, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, there are none that are righteous, no, not one. We live in a world of sin that we can't do anything about on our own. And we certainly cannot save ourselves. But we know that the gospel today, by the gospel, we're saved by God's grace. We're not owed it, but God has chosen by His grace because of the man that he is to save us, because of the God that he is to save us, I should say. Titus chapter 3, Paul writes that we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, not because we're so good that we earned salvation, we deserve salvation, but He says, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, So that being justified by His grace, not by our works, not by our deeds, not by our faith, 
we are justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God saved Noah by grace, and God saves mankind today by grace. It's a new covenant, not the one that He made with Noah, but the one that He makes with us. In Matthew chapter 26, uh, we see verse 28 where, where Jesus says that, uh, For this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Christ died so that we might have God's grace, so that we might be saved, and we certainly are saved by grace. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 11, it says that when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and of bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more then with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of this new covenant that we're a part of today. The new covenant that God made with mankind, those who are willing to to follow through with the covenant. So then, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal uh, inheritance. Noah was saved by grace. Don't let anyone ever tell you that we're not saved by grace. We'll look at other passages as well. We're certainly saved by grace, just like Noah. Noah not only, though, was saved by grace, but he was saved by faith, by his faith. Noah's saved by grace. The scriptures tell us that. But the scriptures also tell us by faith Noah was saved. You see, he was called to do something that didn't make sense. That's what faith is. The heavens things hoped for the assurance of things not yet seen. He had never seen a flood. As far as we know, they'd never experienced rain. And God tells Noah, I'm going to destroy the world with flood. And I want you to do these things. Because you found favor with me. I'm going to extend my grace. But he also was saved by faith in things that he didn't know about. But he had faith in God. He was called to do things that didn't make sense, yet he did them. Noah trusted God. He'd never seen rain, likely he'd never seen every animal in the world. Can you imagine if he'd never seen a giraffe or he'd never seen some of the other animals and they start coming? Maybe he said, no wonder he wants this thing so big. But he trusted God. Hebrews 11, verse 7. Look what it says. By faith. Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah, yeah, he was saved by grace, but he was also saved by faith. He's in the Hebrew Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11. We read all the list of those in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, Moses, by faith, Abraham, by faith, on and on it goes, that they did something. They were called to action and they showed their faith. Same for us today. We are saved by faith. We're saved by grace. We're saved by faith. A faith in things that are unseen. We think about it, Hebrews chapter 1 says that God now speaks to us through His Son. Have you all seen Jesus? No, but we have faith in Jesus and His Word that He speaks to us through His Word. And we're obedient to that. We're called to obey His Word. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. Faith 
comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. We're saved by faith. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him, has faith in Him, shall be saved. And he who does not have faith, does not believe, shall be condemned. We're saved by faith. A faith in things that we've not seen. How many of you have seen heaven? How many of you have seen hell? We haven't seen those things, but we believe in them. We have faith in them. And we put our trust in the word of a resurrected Savior. So today, we know that we're saved by grace. But we're also saved by faith. It's a faith that, number three, leads us to obedience. Now, if Noah did not have faith, he would not have obeyed. How do we know that he had faith in his obedience? We're saved by grace. We're saved by faith. We're saved by a faith that leads us to obedience. It's not a deedless faith. It's not a faith that says, I don't have to do anything but just believe, just acknowledge. It's more than that. Noah could have said, yeah, okay, and just waited around for it to happen. I believe that he could have just sat there and not built the ark. What saved him? Well, God saved him by his grace. And God saved him by giving the plans uh, which something would survive what was going to happen. Now, if Noah had decided to not do it, he would not have been saved. Even though God's grace had been extended, he still had to have faith. And he still had to obey. And he had to obey God the way that God asked him. He could have decided, I'll build it out of oak wood instead of gopher wood. I'll put three windows in instead of two. I'll put three doors in instead of one. He could have done those things. And he would not have been obedient to God's word. He could have said, you know, I'm just going to do it my way. That doesn't make sense. I want to do it the way it makes sense to me. That's way too big or not big enough. He could have said a lot of different things. And if he did, he wouldn't have been obedient, would he? And if he wasn't obedient, he wouldn't have had faith. And if he wouldn't have faith, he couldn't have been saved by God's grace either. Look what it says in Genesis 6, verse 22, the end of the chapter. Thus Noah did. According to all that God had commanded him, so he did. He obeyed. Genesis 7, verse 5. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Verse 9. There went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God commanded Noah. Verse 16. Those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him. And the Lord closed it behind him, closed the door. Noah did as the Lord commanded. The same for us, as we'll see. Uh, he obeyed, therefore he was saved. We understand that. No one ever doubts that he obeyed all that the Lord commanded. No one doubts that if he had decided to do something his way or what made sense, he would not have been saved. And so what about us today? The faith that we're called to have is not a deedless faith. We're saved by grace. We're saved by faith. We're saved by faith that leads to obedience to doing all that God has commanded us. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, let's think about that. You could also say, If you keep my commandments, then you love me. The antithesis, the opposite of that is, If you don't keep my commandments, then you do not love me. This idea of keeping commandments is, is obedience. It's something that we do. It's not something that we say. 1 John 5, verses uh, 3 through 4, 3 and 4, we're told about this acting 
He says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And, and this is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith. It's interesting in that same passage, you're talking about faith and keeping commandments. I don't think you can have one without the other. We live in a time when a lot of people claim to have faith. But it's a deedless faith. It's a dead faith. James chapter 2. James says this. What use is it, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but he has no works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed, and yet you do not give them the things necessary, if it's a deedless faith, he says, what use is that? Even so, faith, uh, even so, uh, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. And he says, show me your faith without your works. And I want to challenge you, you can't. And James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. Yeah, we're saved by grace. We're saved by faith. Is a faith that leads to obedience. Is a faith that is involves deeds. Not that we earn it, but we're just doing what God has commanded us to do. We're saved by faith and obedience. We're saved by grace. You can't exclude one from another. And then in this story, that's really the gospel in the Old Testament. Saved by grace. Saved by faith. Saved by obedience. And he was saved from destruction. Now Noah's salvation was from the flood. It was from complete annihilation. Look what he says in verse uh, 21 through 23. All flesh that moved on the earth perished. Wow. Birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky. And they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. I mean, everything was gone. Complete annihilation. Nothing remained alive except for that which was in the ark and they were saved from that and now our salvation because of God's grace and because of our faith and because of our obedience to what God commands us to do we too will be saved from destruction what kind of destruction is it well Peter tells us the entire world will be burned up 1 Thessalonians 1 6 through 9 tells us that that uh, about this eternal destruction that is ours, uh, that awaits those who do not know God and those who do not obey His Word. He says, after all, it's only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to those who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven and His mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey, there's that word, obey, were saved by grace, faith, and obedience, dealing out retribution to those who do not know and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Revelation 21, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. He's talking about after the judgment of Christ, when he comes again. He says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear 
from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, no mourning or crying, no pain. The first things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But he says in verse 8, But the cowardly, unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Jesus describes that place as a place where there's weeping and, gnash, uh, and the gnashing of teeth. A place that's not pleasant, a place that we don't want to be a part of. And we're saved from that because of God's grace and our faith and our obedience. Just as Noah and his family were saved from destruction. I want you to know something. God is not going to ignore sin. For those that are not in Christ, God is not going to ignore sin. I mean, think about it. In Genesis 6, God's grace ran out. There came a time when he said, Enough is enough. I've given them opportunity, I've given them chance. I've been patient, but no more. Did you know that Jesus talked about that? In Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus warns them. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. There's going to come a time when God says enough is enough, and destruction is going to come, and if you're not ready... It'll be too late. Noah found salvation. He and his family were saved from destruction because of the flood. And we too can find salvation if we're obedient to God's word, if we do all that he commands us. And it involves God's grace. There's no way that we could ever earn it. There's no way that we could ever stand before God and say, God, open up. I've done what I've, all I'm supposed to do. I've done enough where you can't deny me. We can never do enough. It involves God's grace, just like Noah. But it also involves faith. Noah had to have faith in what God was telling him had to have enough faith to believe and act upon it, to obey God's word when he said, build it this way with this material, and to do these things. And time and again, it says, Noah did all that God commanded. He was obedient. Same for us. It involves faith. It's a faith that works, a faith that involves obedience. We have to be Uh, Be obedient to God's plan, to all that he's commanded. Do what he says. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of the Lord. Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For everyone who comes to God must believe that he is and that it's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We have to repent. God's word tells us. Jesus says in Luke 13, 3. Here Paul says in Acts 27, on our Acts 17 on Mars Hill, that God declares that all men everywhere should repent, which means that we're sorry for the sin that we've done and we're going to try not to do it again. We have to confess. The great confession, Matthew 6, Jesus says, Whom do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah, some say the prophet. And he says, Yeah, but who do you say? And Peter said, Thou art the Christ. The Son of the living God. That's the good confession. Jesus says, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Acts chapter 8, the eunuch 
makes the good confession, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have to confess. And then Jesus says that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. As a matter of fact, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, as in the days of Noah who were saved by water, they were saved from sin, they were saved from destruction in the ark. So we too, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of flesh, but an answer and appeal to God for a good conscience. Doing what God asks us to do. We're going to talk about that tonight as well. About baptism. It's so misunderstood. We're just going to look at what the scripture says. For We must be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38 We don't earn it. I want to tell you, Noah had to build the ark, didn't he? We have to be obedient to God's word. It's a simple lesson. It's one we don't hear a whole lot of. But we need those lessons from time to time to remind us of what the gospel is. To remind us of the relationship between God's grace and our faith and our obedience. The lesson is yours. It's from God's word. And if you need to respond in any way, we encourage you to come now as we stand and as we sing. heaven our most gracious most loving God we come before you this morning father and we are uh, feel so blessed to, to be in your presence 
And Father, it is our heart's desire that everything we've done here this morning has been pleasing to you, that you've been glorified. Father, not only here, but as we depart into our daily lives throughout this week, we pray that we could be that, that, that reflection of your love, that beacon of hope to this world that is around us, um, that we could extend the same love and, and, and grace that you have shown us to others. Father, we are so thankful for that very special relationship that we have with you, that you were willing to redeem us even while we were unworthy. Pray that we would never lose sight of that, that it could inspire us to um, be good servants to you, that we could be um, productive and, and fruitful in the things that we do. Father, we pray that... Um, you would go with us throughout this world, knowing, Father, that it is difficult. We thank you for your word and what it means to us. We thank you for stories like the story of Noah that, that can clarify things for us and, and that can be used as great illustrations when teaching others, um, knowing the importance of every aspect of our salvation, Father, not only that it is by your grace that, our, um, that we are saved, but Father, also if, um, that our faith and our obedience is, is uh, just as important. Father, we just pray that you would be with this church here at Medill and every member as we continue to work in this community around us, um, that we could reach out to those who are in need uh, to make changes in their lives, that we could sow those seeds, that we could plant though, um, plant your word that it might be, that it might grow and, and through those efforts, Father, that, that, that souls will be saved. We pray for all of the members of our church who are going through um, difficult times right now, whatever it may be, uh, whether it's uh, just the trials of life, whether it's health complications or, or whatever. Um, we pray for your peace and understanding. And Father, as a, as, a, as a church family, as brothers and sisters, we pray that we could reach out to those that we know are, are, are going through hard times and that we would be there for them um, as we are able. Father, we pray that you would just go with us as we depart. And, uh, and if it is your will uh, to allow us to come back at the next appointed time, and it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.